again. Welcome to another session of Anatomy and Physiology with Dr. H. And uh, today, what I'm trying to give you is a little bit of a lecture on how and what an action potential is. And there's a lot that goes into this, this set of words, action potential. It can be really confusing the first time you go to try to learn about action potentials. It takes a lot of pieces of the puzzle to come together so that you can actually understand what an action potential is and how it works. But ultimately, physiology is all about how something works. And that's what we're going to try to break down for you guys today. So I think the very beginning of understanding what an action potential is is to ask ourselves what the word potential even means. And in science, when we say the word potential, what we're asking or what we're saying is voltage. Okay? Potential. The word potential means voltage. So maybe this will help clear up a few things for people that are just beginning to learn about action potentials is that a potential is voltage, and most people have heard the term voltage before, and know that voltage has to do with electricity. And that's what action potentials have to do with, is electricity. And we can think of an action potential. The word action tells us that electricity has an action. And in the human body, that action is typically uh, relating to the movement of that electricity. Down, for instance, an axon of a neuron. It's not the only case for action potentials in the human body, but it's a pretty good representation of what we're dealing with when we say the word action. Moving. Moving voltage. Moving potential. So, let's look at what voltage is. What exactly is voltage? And when you guys learned about a plasma membrane, and that's what we need to go down to, when we're looking at action potentials, we're looking at the voltage across the plasma membrane. So we're going to simplify our plasma membrane. We're going to say this is a phospholipid bilayer. This out here is going to be the extracellular fluid, or the ECF, and this in here is going to be the intracellular fluid, or the ICF. And this is our phospholipid bilayer. And if you recall, right, phospholipid bilayer has two sides attracted to water, so two sides that are hydrophilic, so two sides that are polar. And the entire center of this is the lipid tails. Right? These are the fatty acids. The entire core is nonpolar. And what's so great about nonpolar things is that they are not charged. And non-charged chemicals, well, they repel charged chemicals. So if we're just looking at charges, something like sodium has a positive charge. A positive charge, a positive charge. And we start seeing charges line up on a cell membrane. Can those charges just get through a plasma membrane on their own? If the core is nonpolar, then it repels charged molecules. Therefore, charges cannot make it through that cell membrane on their own, even if there is a large difference between the two sides. Remember, diffusion relies on concentration gradients. And the difference between these two sides is simply if you take one side and subtract the other side, so arbitrarily, we said there are seven positive charges on the ECF and three positive charges in the ICF. That's just arbitrary. We just made that as an example, because why not? And these positive charges want to go from an area of high to low. They want to go into the cell, but right now they can't. And it's the separation of these charges, the separation of these charges, that's what we define as voltage. Voltage is the separation of charges. So when we have a different number of charges outside of the cell compared to the inside of the cell, this is voltage. 
in this nonpolar core of a phospholipid membrane bilayer, this is an insulator. This insulates the movement of voltage. It makes it so that we can separate those charges from one another. <clears throat> the last term that you'll often hear related to electricity is current. So maybe you guys have heard this term current before. Well, current now is defined as the movement of charges. And if you think about a cell membrane, a plasma membrane, what allows things to move across that plasma membrane? The answer is channels and other transport proteins. So if we integrate a protein into our cell membrane here, what can we finally do? Let's say, for instance, this is a cation channel. Cation tells us a positively charged ion. So now these positively charged ions can move from an area of high to low. Now they can move through the plasma membrane. And the movement of those charges across the membrane is called current. So now we have current. I think that's the background that a lot of people are missing. Hopefully that made sense to you. Because what we are going to need to do is we're going to have to figure out how a cell even creates a voltage in the first place. How do cells separate charges to begin with? And then we're going to end up talking about our graph, the action potential curve, that most professors just say, here, memorize. I want you guys to learn how an action potential is even made. What allows the membrane potential to even set itself to what's called a resting membrane potential? And it all has to do with voltage. And what an action potential is, is once we allow current to start to move across that membrane, we can measure that current using this graph. So let's do this. <clears throat> let's do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, and this is what you guys should start to think about, is you start with an arbitrary cell. So just make a circle. Not all cells in the human body are circular, but our arbitrary cell is going to be circular. Because why the heck not? And this will be a plasma membrane. Okay, this will be a plasma membrane. One way to look at this is if the charges on the side of the membrane <coughs> If the charges all the way around this membrane are exactly equal to the number of charges on the other side of the membrane, if the charges are exactly equal to one another, is there a difference between those two sides? Is 6 minus 6, is there a difference? 6 minus 6 is 0. So there'd be no difference, and charges wouldn't want to try to move towards one another. So in order to even think about making a potential voltage, we need to separate charges from one another. How do we do that? Well, every single cell in the human body is covered in what I consider to be the most important transport protein in the human body. And at this point, if you're watching this video, you should have probably already learned about it. Okay, this particular transport protein is always moving three sodium out of the cell in exchange for two potassium into the cell. And it utilizes ATP for that function. So which transport protein am I? I am the sodium potassium ATP pump. The sodium potassium pump, you can name it, you don't have to put the ATP in there, it's a little redundant because pump literally says we use ATP. And let's look at what this is doing. If I am constantly moving sodium out of the cell, I'm pumping it out every microsecond of every day. Every microsecond of every day, sodium's getting pumped out of the cell then the sodium concentration outside of the cell starts to increase. And we can start writing in a whole bunch of sodium out here. And we're just going to put six sodium to make our lives a little bit easier. 
And let's say it's pumping in potassium. So what's happening to the potassium concentration inside of the cell? The potassium concentration inside of that cell would be increasing as well. So let's go ahead and draw in some potassium. Again, this is a little bit arbitrary. For learning about how this thing works, don't worry too much about the number of potassium and sodium that you're putting in. It doesn't really matter in terms of the concept. There is a difference in the number that you might have to learn about at some point, but for now, let's not worry about that. So the sodium potassium ATP pump is pumping potassium into the cell all the time, but please don't forget, that doesn't mean there's no potassium out here. There's always a little bit of potassium outside the cell. It doesn't mean that there's no sodium inside the cell. There's always a little bit of sodium inside the cell. Got it. It doesn't mean there's only one sodium, though, so don't take me literal. It just means that the concentration of sodium outside the cell is greater than the concentration of sodium inside the cell. What does that give us? That gives us a difference. So now we have a concentration gradient. Sodium wants to go from an area of high to low. Potassium wants to go from an area of high to low. So let's do something. Getting a handful of markers here. Let's do something. Let's take and introduce a channel to this cell. And all the cells that I know of in your body have these channels. So we're going to just draw in these channels as a purple line. And we're going to draw in a bunch of them. Okay? There's a lot of these channels, and they surround your entire cell, but we don't want to cluster up our picture. So we're just going to draw them in here. And we're going to say these are channels that are open all the time. So these are going to be potassium leak channels. And if they're open all the time, then ions can pass through them. And since these are named potassium leak channel, we know that the ion that can go through them is potassium. So as long as they're open, potassium now can leak out of the cell because it's going to go from an area of high to an area of low. Okay. We're going to call this potassium efflux. Efflux is the movement of ions out of the cell, whereas the movement of ions into the cell would be called influx. So let's look at this. Before we had efflux, before this happened, Look at what the difference that we have in charges. Okay, we have six sodium outside the cell and one potassium. Arbitrary. We just subjectively chose that number. We have six potassium inside the cell and one sodium. So that's seven positive charges outside the cell and seven positive charges inside the cell. So what's the difference between that in our arbitrary artificial cell that we are inventing seven positive charges outside seven positive charges inside that would net out as zero because seven minus seven is zero so therefore the charge difference here in this example is zero so when we would look at this what we do is in a laboratory setting we take and use what's called a microelectrode. We actually take a big long glass pipette, heat the end, and we stretch it. And we make this tiny little tip that under a microscope, we can puncture the tip of that microelectrode down into the cell membrane. We take this microelectrode and we puncture it down into the cell membrane and we measure the charge on the inside of that cell membrane. We measure that charge. We also have, as a part of our system, another electrode that's going to be measuring what's happening out here in the ECF. And then we compare the two and we say, what is the inside of the cell relative to the outside of the cell? So if there are seven positive charges inside the cell and there are seven positive charges outside the cell, what is the inside of the cell relative to the outside of the cell? And hopefully your answer is zero.
there's no difference. So the inside is exactly equal to the outside in this example that I just drew. This is not real life. I'm just trying to get you guys set up on this curve. Because what we have in place here are potassium leak channels. What we have in place are potassium leak channels. And potassium does what? Because it's moving from an area of high to low, potassium starts to leak out of this cell. We get potassium efflux. And what charge does potassium have on it? A positive charge. So as potassium leaves, what happens to the inside of the cell relative to the outside? The inside gets less positive and the outside gets more positive. Therefore, the difference between the two sides is going to start to get greater. And, and the inside becomes more negative relative to the outside. And that's what we see here. So how does this curve start to drop? Potassium leaks out. And now more potassium leaks out. And then more potassium leaks out. And we drop, and we drop, and we drop. And if, only there, if, if there were only potassium leak channels in the plasma membrane, then the membrane potential would go all the way down to about negative 90 millivolts before settling out. But there's not only potassium leak channels in most neurons and skeletal muscles. We also have sodium leak channels. But I'm only going to draw a couple of sodium leak channels. So let's label these as sodium leak channel. What do you guys see in my picture? Are there more potassium leak channels or are there more sodium leak channels? Hopefully you guys can see that there are more potassium leak channels and sodium leak channels. And in a real cell, there are a lot more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels. There's only a few sodium leak channels. And why that's important is because now only a little bit of sodium can leak through the sodium leak channel, and sodium is higher outside the cell, and so a little bit of sodium is going to enter. A little bit of sodium is going to enter, and this is sodium influx. And if a little bit of sodium enters the cell, sorry about the room here, I just kind of ran out of room, but if only a little bit of sodium enters the cell, well, what charge is sodium? Sodium is a positive charge. So now if sodium starts leaking into the cell, what's going to happen to the charge of the inside of the cell relative to the outside is gaining positive charges. Therefore, it starts to become more positive. And that's what sets the homeostasis for your plasma membrane voltage. That's what sets resting membrane potential, which is abbreviated as RMP. And the RMP of most neurons and skeletal muscles is negative 70 millivolts. How? I just explained how. So to summarize, the reason why resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts is because potassium leaves through potassium leak channels faster than sodium enters through sodium leak channels, thus potassium leaving makes the inside of the cell more negative relative to the inside of the cell, and that's how we just get resting membrane potential. It takes a lot of time and practice just to learn that. And why that's important is because if we start changing the concentration of sodium and potassium outside of the cell, if we start changing a patient's concentration of sodium and potassium, or if they have a disease that makes it so that they are hypokalemic, kalemia, K-A-L-E-M. Kalemia means potassium. Emia means in the blood. 
So if we start changing the amount of potassium in the blood, then we're going to change the rate that potassium can diffuse through that plasma membrane, and we start changing resting membrane potentials through the entire body. The rest of that lecture would be for another YouTube channel video because we don't want to try to complicate things more than they already are. Let's get back into action potentials. All we've done so far is set a resting membrane potential. Action potentials relate back to something that you've seen in a lot of the graphs, or in all the graphs that you probably looked at with action potentials, and that's this other dashed line called threshold. And the way I want to teach you guys, threshold's anywhere between negative 50 to ne negative 55. I like to write it in as negative 55 millivolts. What threshold is, it's the energy required to open up voltage-gated channels. So in my mind, when I think threshold, when I see the word threshold on an exam or in a homework or wherever, I immediately say voltage-gated channels. Which voltage-gated channels are in this system? I gotta know, I gotta know, because threshold is there. It gotta be voltage-gated channels. Voltage gated channel, volt, volt, what, voltage, right? What is going to stimulate a voltage gated channel? This is now going to be a channel with a gate in it that can open or close. And the answer, what's going to be the stimulus to open that is voltage. And that's what this number right here is. That's the voltage or the energy required to open up that voltage gated channel. So threshold is always going to be related with voltage-gated channels. So what's going to happen in that real body? Okay, let's now start to walk ourselves through what's going to happen. We're going to add some more things over here to our arbitrary cell. You see that it's expanding. Don't try to look at the snapshot at, it, at, at the end. Make sure you can go through step by step. Resting. So the cell is just going to be chilling, right? It's just chilling. It's a resting membrane potential. It's happy as a clam, whatever the heck that saying means. It's happy. It's at homeostasis. It's Goldilocks. It's right where it wants to be. And what's going to end up happening, this is going to be what we call RMP. What's going to end up happening is the cell is going to receive a signal doesn't really matter how that signal gets to it. Most of the time it's through a graded potential, what's called an uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential. But it can happen in any way where we have positive charges build up inside of that cell. And as positive charges build up inside of that cell, it's going to cause the inside of the cell to become more positive relative to resting membrane potential. This is called depolarization, and it's the first step of depolarization. Okay, This portion right here is just the first step of depolarization as it ramps up. Now, if that depolarization does not hit threshold, if the energy that this cell receives doesn't hit threshold, it's just going to go right back to resting membrane potential. It never hits threshold, so a voltage-gated channel never opens. So the stimulus that this cell is receiving must be supra threshold, must be supra above, must be supra threshold in order to open up voltage gated channels. So we're going to draw this stimulus to threshold. At which point, the second that this particular action, whatever it may be, hits threshold, what did I just teach you is going to open at threshold? The answer are voltage-gated channels. And there are two major types of voltage-gated channels, more than that ultimately in the body, but two that you need to know as you're starting to learn about action potentials. Those two major types of voltage-gated channels, and I'm just going to abbreviate it as VG channels, are one, 
voltage gated sodium channels and two voltage gated potassium channels. Voltage gated sodium channels are unique and voltage gated potassium channels are unique because hopefully at this point in your anatomy and physiology career you know anatomy determines physiology structure determines function these two have different functions therefore they're going to have different structures so what exactly are those structures well if we were to draw out a voltage gated sodium channel as it overlaps a plasma membrane so there's going to be my plasma membrane I'm going to draw it out nice and big. So that's my plasma membrane right there. And I'm going to put a voltage-gated sodium channel in place. And I'm not going to be able to draw it like a real voltage-gated sodium channel would look like. I don't even try. Just put two big old blobs in that plasma membrane and create some gates because these are gated channels. So I'm going to create one gate and I'm going to create another gate. One gate I'm going to have starting as open, meaning that it's not going to be closing the ions from passing through the membrane, and the other one's going to be closed. Voltage-gated sodium channels have two gates, not just one. They have two gates. One of those gates is called an activation gate. And I'm going to just write an A next to it so that you know which one is the activation gate. This one down here on the bottom will be my activation gate. The other one's called an inactivation gate, and I'm going to put that one in here on the top. So this one is my inactivation gate, and it starts open. The other one is my activation gate, and it starts closed. Because what does that word activation tell you? That when threshold is met, and we activate this channel, it's going to open up that gate. And once that gate is open, now the channel is open, and ions can pass through. Which type of ion can cross through a voltage-gated sodium channel? Only sodium. And if this is the outside of the cell, and this is the inside of the cell, sodium concentrations are higher in the ECF than they are in the ICF. So brackets in science mean concentration. So this is an increase in the concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid. It's high. Therefore, if this channel were to open, if we were to activate the activation gate, if we were to activate the activation gate, now we'd have an open channel pore and sodium can start moving through it. And since sodium is higher outside of the cell, it rushes into the cell. And what charge does sodium have? It has plus charges. So as sodium rushes into the cell, it makes the inside of the cell relatively more positive. So if we go down on our graph, if sodium were rushing into the cell, it would make our graph more positive, closer to zero or even above zero. Voltage-gated potassium channel. So for voltage-gated potassium channel, I'm going to draw them in over on this side. I'm going to just make them green here. Voltage-gated potassium channels are pretty cool. They have what's called a ball and chain. So there's a chain protein, and at the end of that chain protein is a big protein ball. And what allows this ball to move is the chain. So this ball could either be in the pocket, or it can be removed from the pocket of that channel. So if the ball is in the pocket, it blocks the pocket, and nothing can move through it. If the ball is removed from the pocket, now we got ourselves an access for something. This process of moving this chain-like protein is slow. So this is our voltage-gated potassium channel, and it 
opens very slow because of that chain. The voltage-gated sodium channel opens extremely fast. So what's going to come first? What's going to open first? The voltage-gated sodium channels open first. At the same time, the voltage-gated potassium channels are going to start to open, but they're slow. But once they're fully open, potassium can finally move through this channel, and it can move through at a relatively fast pace. And where is potassium higher, inside the cell or outside the cell? Potassium is higher in the ICF, right? So we can say, I just drew it separate, different than what I just drew up here, and I apologize about that. Woo! Man, this green is green! Right, so we'll go ahead and say there's an increase in the potassium concentration inside of the cell, just so we keep ourselves consistent with what we wrote up here. And if that's the case, now if this channel is open, potassium can leave. And what charge does potassium have? Potassium has a positive charge. Therefore, the inside of the cell is losing positive charges making the inside of the cell relatively more negative. And if this curve were to come back down, right, it's becoming more negative. As it goes from zero to negative 70, that's because potassium is rushing out of the cell, making the outside of the cell relatively more positive compared to the inside of the cell. Let's go back to our graph now. What do we know opens at threshold? voltage-gated channels. Which voltage-gated channels open at threshold? Both of them. But which one opens first because it's faster? The voltage-gated sodium channel opens first because it's faster. And therefore, at threshold, the voltage-gated sodium channel, the activation gate, boom, it opens. And when it opens, sodium just comes rushing into that cell. Sodium influx is just a torrent. Okay, It rushes into that cell causing this super rapid depolarization phase. It's going to shoot all the way up to about plus 30 millivolts, at which time the inactivation gate closes. And if this inactivation gate closes, then it stops the influx of sodium and we can no longer shoot up, making it more positive. It's starting to push against its electrochemical gradient anyways, but at the peak, therefore, right here, the inactivation gate for the voltage-gated sodium channel closes, but what's going to finally be fully open? The voltage-gated potassium channel is fully open. Sodium stops rushing in, and potassium can rush out. Okay, so this is potassium efflux. Caused because of the closing of the voltage-gated sodium channel, the inactivation gate, and because of the opening, the full opening of the voltage-gated potassium channel. And as it drops, as it drops, as it drops, it's going to reach threshold. It's going to drop below threshold. The stimulus for opening these gates was threshold. So when we're below threshold, it's going to start to close these gates. And it's going to start to get the voltage-gated sodium channel back to its original position. The activation gate's going to close. Then the inactivation gate's going to open. This occurs fast. Boom, boom. We're back to our starting position, but what do we know about the voltage-gated potassium channel, the ball and chain? The chain is slow. So even though the voltage-gated potassium channel starts to close, it can't close fast enough. And potassium rushes out of the cell, and it overcompensates. It overcompensates, causing a hyperpolarization phase. Hyperpolarization. Anything below resting membrane potential is hyperpolarization. But finally, down here in the middle of the hyperpolarization step, the voltage-gated potassium channel fully closes, and that's going to allow 
due to the potassium leak channels, sodium leak channels, and the sodium potassium ATP pump, that's going to bring everything back to resting membrane potential. And once it's back to resting membrane potential, it's going to be waiting for the next signal. So we're back here at RMP again. Let's do this all together. We start out at resting membrane potential because sodium leaks out of the channel. Nope. <laughs> Let's do this again. We start at the resting membrane potential because potassium leaks out of the cell faster than sodium leaks in. That's what we started with. At which point, positive charges, doesn't matter how, some EPSP, some excitatory postsynaptic potential, it could be calcium, sodium, potassium, doesn't matter. However we increase the positive charges inside of a cell, it's going to cause a small little depolarization step that we show in light green here. If that EPSP is supra-threshold, it will cause an action potential. If it's sub-threshold, no action potential occurs. If it's supra-threshold, at threshold, the activation gate for the voltage-gated sodium channel opens, allowing for the massive influx of sodium through that membrane into the cell. Positive charges come rushing into that cell, creating a peak voltage. At about plus 30, the inactivation gate for the voltage-gated sodium channels close, and the voltage-gated potassium channels fully open, allowing potassium to rush out of the cell, potassium efflux, it reaches threshold, the voltage-gated sodium channels reset itself, but the voltage-gated potassium channel closes slowly, causing an overextension of potassium efflux, creating a hyperpolarizing step. Finally, the voltage-gated potassium channels fully close, Due to the leak channels and the pumps, we're going to return this cell to resting membrane potential. I hope that was helpful. Not just a bunch of blibbity blop up on a whiteboard. I'm always, always, always just trying to help. Little pieces of the puzzle come together to create the puzzle. And there's even more to this, like how does this thing really truly work, like in a neuron or in a skeletal muscle, that's going to take even more practice beyond this. So for now, learn how an action potential works, and then you can learn how you can change an action potential, which now will affect future patients if you're going into the medical field, or your experimental studies if you're going into the biology field, or whatever the case may be. Let's think about that. What if we blocked voltage-gated sodium channels? If we use a drug to block those voltage-gated sodium channels, we block the activation gate from opening. Will an action potential occur even if we have a super-threshold EPSP? No. We block the voltage-gated sodium channels. They can't open. Therefore, there's no action potential. It doesn't exist. So now, the example I like to give, touch your arm. What does this all mean? How do we put this into a real-life perspective? Touch your arm. What happened out here? When you touched your arm, you put pressure on receptors. Okay. Those receptors now create a receptor potential. This is an EPSP. This is an excitatory postsynaptic, in essence, potential. It's a type of graded potential. It's called a receptor potential, which now creates an action potential because we get a supra-threshold event that's going to send that action potential through the cord up to your spinal cord, through the cord, I meant axon, through the axon, up into the spinal cord, up to the brain, and then we perceive or are aware of that touch. That's how you can feel the touch. The feeling doesn't come from down here. It only comes because that signal gets sent to your brain. So what if we block that signal? What if we block the action potentials? Now you don't feel anything.
And this is what lidocaine is. This is what all local anesthetics are. Any sort of analgesic that blocks pain at the local level is somehow going to probably affect an action potential curve somehow. Any protein, like these guys, we're probably going to have some sort of pharmaceutical drug that can affect that protein, which allows us to do the medicine we need to do and the patients that we need to try to fix. I hope this is enlightening. I hope this kind of made some little light bulbs go off in some brains. That's all for now. Until next time, uh, humankind, be bold.